So now we're going to talk about the um, individual joints, the interaction of the joints, the arthrokinematics and, and kinematics of the joints, osteokinematics, and um, four joints in the shoulder complex. So there's a lot going on there. And it really takes interaction from all those four joints um, moving in their normal motion and adjusted properly in order for, to have normal shoulder motion. So um, the shoulder is a pretty complex structure. You can have restriction at one joint that's causing a problem at another. So my favorite um, shoulder joint interaction story recently, um, I actually had two of these recently. One person was a, um, had an infection at their sternoclavicular joint, which they had to have surgically debrided twice. And um, it really restricted motion at their glenohumeral joint. So after they recovered from the infection, then we had to work on regaining motion in the glenohumeral joint. So um, pretty interesting. And then I recently worked with a lady who had a fractured clavicle. Um, same thing. She, um, her clavicle was fractured, and it really compromised the motion in all her other shoulder complex joints. So the shoulder complex functions through interactions of the sternoclavicular joint, the scapulothoracic joint, the acromioclavicular joint, and finally, the glenohumeral joint, which a lot of times when we think of the shoulder, we think of the glenohumeral joint, and we forget about the other three, but though they're very important to the motion of the glenohumeral joint. Same thing if you don't have good motion at your scapulothoracic joint, you're not going to have good motion at your glenohumeral joint. Um, they all affect each other and they all interact. So we'll start with the sternoclavicular joint since it's our um, first bony attachment to the axial skeleton, our only bony attachment for the upper extremity. It's created by the articulation of the medial aspect of the clavicle with the, the manubrium of the sternum. It provides the only direct bony attachment of the upper extremity to the axial skeleton. It's stable while also allowing extensive mobility. What a great combo. That's what saddle joints are good at, right? So the carpometacarpal joint, same thing, stable with extensive mobility. So we can grab onto things. Sternoclavicular joint, same thing. So unlike the carpometacarpal joint, the sternoclavicular joint has three degrees of freedom. It allows motion in all three cardinal planes. Um, it's supported by a thick network of ligaments and an articular disc and a joint capsule, which we talked about in the last section. The high degree of stability of the sternoclavicular joint explains why fractures of the clavicle occur more than dislocations of the SC joint. Um, so the SC joint is strong and the clavicle is weaker than that. And so it's the next weak link in the chain. And um, acromioclavicular joint dislocations happen far more often than sternoclavicular joint dislocations. Unless you're a medieval knight and then you've got other issues. So um, the, the kinematics of the saddle joint, um, it's got concave and convex surfaces on each of the joint surfaces, so it allows that clavicle movement in all three planes. Um, elevation and depression, which um, is the sort of grayish purple arrows on the picture. So it's the lateral end of the, um, cl uh, the clavicle going superiorly and inferiorly. Um, protraction and retraction, which is the blue arrows, and the um, it's the lateral end of the clavicle going anteriorly and posteriorly, and rotation, which is the little green arrow. So when you um, elevate your arm, either in flexion or abduction, the um, clavicle has to rotate posteriorly to accommodate that motion, and um, you can um, get a really nice pin and stretch. Uh, on the subclavius by um, pinning the muscle underneath the clavicle as you have the patient elevate their arm. We'll talk about that more in manual therapy class. <laughs> so we'll talk about each of the motions, but you know the old sternoclavicular joint catches me out every year. Um, in the uh, joint chapter I think I said uh, that the um, scapula, uh, the scapula and the mandible are the only things that protract and retract, but I was wrong. The sternoclavicular joint also does it. So a couple of years ago it caught me out on the saddle joint, this year it caught me on protraction and retraction. So I have to watch out for my sternoclavicular joint.
So elevation and depression is a near frontal plane movement, meaning it's slightly out of the frontal plane, but mostly frontal plane. And it allows roughly 45 degrees of clavicular elevation and 10 degrees of depression from anatomical position, so a total of 55 degrees. Um, protraction and retraction occur in the horizontal plane about a vertical axis of rotation, allowing about 15 to 30 degrees of clavicular motion in either direction. So that's quite a bit of motion. You can imagine with um, horizontal ab and adduction, you get some clavicular protraction and retraction. Um, try it. See how see what uh, other motions it takes to protract and retract your clavicles. Rotation. The clavicle ro rotates posteriorly about its longitudinal axis as the shoulder abducts and the coracoclavicular ligament becomes taut. It spins the clavicle posteriorly. So it's not a muscular action that makes this happen. It's um, a, a ligament. Um, the clavicle rotates anteriorly back to its rest position as the shoulder is um, extended or adducted. So the scapulothoracic joint is not a true joint in the traditional sense. It refers to the junction created by the anterior aspect of the scapula on the posterior thorax. So it's the concave um, subscapular fossa um, moving on the, on the convex rib cage. Um, so, usually we're describing the motion of the scapular Jurassic, uh, Jurassic, oh my gosh, the scapular thoracic joint. We're describing it relative to the posterior rib cage. So when we say elevation and depression and um, ab and adduction and upward and downward rotation, we're, it's movement on the rib cage. So, um, the motions at the scapulothoracic joint include elevation and depression, up and down, um, and that's um, in the frontal plane, retraction and protraction, and that's sort of in an oblique plane. The scapulothoracic movements are not necessarily in um, cardinal planes. They, it tends to have oblique movements. And upward and downward rotation, and we'll talk extensively about those guys. Um, it's a companion motion to a lot of glenohumeral motions, as most of the scapular thoracic motions are. So scapular elevation involves the scapula sliding superiorly on the thorax, so you're shrugging your shoulders. Or, as I like to say, you're wearing your shoulders as earrings. Um, scapular depression is when the scapula slides inferior on the thorax, so returning the shrugged shoulders to a resting position. We're always telling people to do that in uh, the clinic, like uh, bring your shoulders down, tuck your scapula in your back pockets. <laughs> so protraction is the motion of the scapulae sliding laterally on the thorax, and retraction is the movement of the scapulae toward the midline. You could, in all truth, call protraction um, abduction and retraction adduction if you wanted to, but we have special names for those, just for the, just for the good old scapula. Uh, upward rotation occurs as the scapular glenoid fossa rotates upward, and um, the downward rotation as the scapula returns from an upwardly rotated position to its resting position. So um, you can think of that like the cup of the glenoid fossa is turning up, an upward rotation, turning up to catch some rain or something. Um, and then down rotation, you're dumping that out. Um, you can also think of um, the inferior angle of the scapula. Because we can't palpate the glenic fossa, a lot of times when we're in the lab, we are palpating the inferior angle of the scapula, and we're seeing that move um, anteriorly and superiorly, or, or laterally and superiorly. And um, the downward rotation, it moves back to its original position towards the vertebrae. Um, the acromioclavicular joint is considered a gliding or a plane joint. So remember, a lot of planar joints have um, two degrees of freedom moving in, in two planes of motion. Um, the AC joint is created by the articulation between the lateral aspect of the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula. You've probably noticed that I use a lot of nicknames or abbreviations for the joints because there's only so many times a day you can write or type acromioclavicular. So um, 
So we'll say AC and AC joint, and people know what you're talking about. So it's an accepted abbreviation, SC joint for the sternoclavicular joint. The scapulothoracic joint is not referred to by as ST joint. That's usually the subtalar joint in the foot. That's the only one in the group that doesn't have a nickname. Um, the acromioclavicular joint is the AC joint, and the glenohumeral joint is often called the GH joint. So um, it, just those little um, shorthand things are accepted terminology. Um, so the AC joint is the articulation between the lateral aspect of the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula. It links the motion of the scapula and the attached humerus to the lateral end of the clavicle. And this is a, that same picture that we looked at with all those lovely ligaments that are keeping the scapula from dropping off the body. So the acromioclavicular joint um, allows motion in all three planes. Um, unlike a lot of planar joints, because it, um, it has upward and downward rotation um, of the scapula, that's, that's the difference. Um, it has anterior and posterior tilting, um, and it has um, internal and external rotation in the sagittal plane. So it has, um, it has some little weird motions because the scapula is a weird bone. Um, there's a lot of motion that can happen in the acromion clavicular joint. Um, so the motions of the AC joint sort of fine tune the kinematic relationship between the scapula and the humerus. So they're getting things set just right and allow the scapula to maintain a firm contact with the posterior thorax. So that tilting, that's not a motion that we see at a lot of joints um, because we don't have, this is a unique joint. It's a functional joint and the surfaces are different. So um, the AC joint is um, really the, sca the scapulothoracic joint's little buddy. Um, it, it assists it in all its motions. The glenohumeral joint is um, the one that most of us like to think of as our shoulder joint, um, or GH joint, if you want to say that for short. Uh, it's created by the articulation of the humeral head with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Um, tons of motion in all three planes, but not a lot of stability. Uh, the rotator cuff muscles provide the primary stabilizing force of this joint. It also has loads of ligaments and the labrum and the joint capsule, like we talked about in the last chapter. So it's a ball and socket joint that allows three degrees of freedom, and its primary motions are flexion and extension in the sagittal plane, ab and adduction in the frontal plane, and internal and external rotation in the transverse or horizontal plane. Um, we also have a couple of um, special motions, um, horizontal ab and adduction um, being those special motions. So um, glenohumeral ab and adduction occurs in the frontal plane about an anterior posterior axis of rotation. So what does that tell us? It tells us that in order to perform ab and adduction, um, a muscle has to be um, either superior or inferior. To so perform abduction, it has to be superior to the anterior posterior axis of rotation, like the deltoid, um, or it has to be inferior to the anterior-posterior anterior axis of rotation, like the latissimus dorsi. Um, the glenohumeral joint normally allows about 120 degrees of abduction. So um, how do we get that full 180 degrees of shoulder abduction? Well, we borrow 60 degrees from scapular upward rotation to give us that extra motion. So um, glenohumeral motion accounts for 120 degrees of our full abduction, and scapulothoracic upward rotation allows uh, um, lends 60 degrees to that full 180 degrees. And we'll talk about um, scapulohumeral rhythm, which is um, how those motions interact um, later. So the um, roll and glide, roll and slide um, actions of the glenohumeral joint during ab and adduction. Abduction involves the um, convex head of the humerus rolling superiorly while simultaneously sliding inferiorly to keep that joint congruency. If they if roll and slide happened in the same direction, the head of the humerus would clonk into the acromion process. Um, so that's what happens in impingement when you don't have that inferior slide. 
the upward humerus roll results in the humeral head jamming into the acromion. So a lot of times when we're working on shoulder mechanics, doing shoulder mobilizations, um, we are working on that slide motion. We're doing an inferior mobilization of the head of the humerus in the socket as someone elevates their arm. Pretty cool, right? So glenohumeral flexion and extension occurs in the sagittal plane. The humeral head spins about a relatively fixed axis. So um, for abduction, um, we have to, we get that roll and slide. For flexion and extension, we're actually getting some spin because of the um, geometric orientation of the head of the humerus, which is kind of interesting. About 120 degrees of flexion and 45 degrees of extension are available in a normal joint. Um, the 180 degrees of shoulder flexion is obtained by borrowing 60 degrees from scapular upward rotation. So internal and external rotation of the glenohumeral joint occur in the horizontal plane about a vertical axis of rotation. So in order to, um, to have um, a line of pull for internal rotation, a muscle has to um, go have a medial attachment um, to a lateral attachment. Let's go from medial to lateral and pull medially. Um, in order to, um, and it has to be um, anterior to the joint. If it's posterior to the joint, it has a, li a line of pull for external rotation. So, um, in internal rotation, the anterior of the surface rotates medially. In the external rotation, the anterior surface rotates laterally. Okay? And we'll look at bones and people's arms in the lab and figure that out. So the convex humeral head rolls and slides in opposite directions on the concave glenoid fossa with internal and external rotation. So it's very similar to the hip joint. With ab and adduction, we also have horizontal ab and adduction. So horizontal ab and adduction are weird movements because they do not start at anatomical position. They actually start with the shoulder roughly in 90 degrees of abduction. So we're making a giant capital T with our arms and the movement of the humerus towards the midline in that horizontal plane that is adduction and then movement away from the midline in the horizontal plane is abduction, horizontal abduction. 